I like uh, Kendra and Tony went through the dreamers thing. Thank you for that. And now, according to the program, we were to have Mary Frances um, do a presentation on the impact areas uh, in some late discussions with her and Scarlett. Uh, Scarlett is, is going to do a presentation that starts with the inclusive presentation that she did at the International Convention. And I think you'll greatly appreciate that. Many of us had seen the impact area presentation before, and this is the best way to add to it and update it. So I will turn it over to Scarlett now. ago for your district convention. I am going to share my screen. Yay. Okay. Um, can everybody hear me well? Okay. Um, I'm going to present a little bit of a hodgepodge of a uh, workshop that I think will benefit everyone in this meeting. Um, like John said, um, I, I presented a workshop with the help of the ARC of the United States on being disability inclusive. So I've taken a little bit of that, along with just a tad of the PR workshop from the convention, and then I merged those and even threw in some impact area information. And basically the goal of today's presentation is to make sure you guys are as connected as you can be, some strategies and tips on how to be connected as you can be related to our mission um, and work on areas to enrich your service projects, uh, recruit members, um, and even maybe build some clubs. So I hope um, I hope you will get something out of this. Um, and again, I wanna give a shout out to the ARC of the United States for helping me with this presentation. My favorite part of this presentation is called the Volunteer Vision Plan. And you'll see it in a few slides. And I recommend that you use it for everyone, <laughs> not just members who have um, intellectual and developmental disability. So I'm excited about that. So let's start with the agenda today. We're going to talk just very briefly about why words matter and then how we can work better uh, with people with IDD uh, for everyone's benefit. Some communication tips who doesn't uh, benefit from those? Um, and many of those, if not all, can be used in all situations. And then we're going to dive into inclusive volunteering. We use the word inclusive a lot. What does it really mean to, to uh, be inclusive when it comes to volunteering? And that's where we'll hash out a volunteer vision plan. And then lastly, um, I'll talk to you about how you can weave in those impact areas we've been talking about for last year to connect the dots. Um, for better service projects and uh, recruiting more members for your club. So first of all, I don't know if you can see this well, um, but I want to get your feedback on this billboard that was up in the middle, I believe near Chicago, that one of um, our international board members noticed on her drive home one day. Um, anybody want to give some feedback on this, on this billboard? And I, can, I can't hear the feedback, so um, is, is it alarming, anybody? Yeah, yeah. yeah crippled. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's Shriner. It's British story. It's I like that. Okay, story. I think Denise is walking around. I'm not sure. If, but, you know, it is. Yes, Lynn, that's exactly right. Lynn, on um, virtually, she's saying, I would, I would think this would be like an older billboard back in the 70s or 60s. And actually, this is from this time period in the last few years. And um, obviously, there's some words in this billboard that um, should not be used. And so let's let's just uh, talk about that for a little bit. <laughs> um, and we have done several. I know uh, many of you have been... Uh, benefited from some workshops in the past at Civic International 
to offer related to people first language. I just want to remind everybody of those standards quickly. First of all, you know, if if in a conversation with someone with disability is is not relevant to anything that you're doing, you shouldn't mention it. You shouldn't even talk about it because it's because it doesn't define that person. Um, people first language always refers to the person first and that disability second. Um, but the, the catch here is that some folks don't really abide by people first language who um, have intellectual and developmental disabilities. So you may want to ask, how do you want to be referred to? Um, obviously, the R word is very hurtful. Um, we should not be using um, the R word at all. It is a diagnosis. It still is a diagnosis in the, in the medical uh, field. However, um, it is uh, a derogatory term, usually. And then I put on the bottom some words also to try to avoid handicapped, crippled, special, normal, um, disabled, differently abled. And many of you know my story um, on a personal note. You know, I have a son with autism, and the word special really irks me. <laughs> Because we are all special, and I know it's I know it's included in special education and the, in the school systems and things like that. Um, but it, it, it it's real bothersome because all of us are special, <laughs> and um, you know also normal is another word that it just irks me tremendously. Um, if you're going to describe the community um, that exists that do not have intellectual and developmental disabilities, you want to call them neurotypical. And I know that's a lot of uh, language advice today, but it, it's very important to refer to people um, how they want to be referred to. So, working with people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, you want to treat everyone like you would want to be treated. This is a part of our civic hand creed, isn't it? I mean, that's that's just following uh, what we believe in. Um, you also want to speak in a normal tone. Just because um, they may have autism doesn't mean they can't understand you or that you need to talk louder or talk really slow. Um, I shared this, this a little bit from my personal life. You know, this can come in handy also with uh, people with other differences. So uh, when I was growing up, we lived next to a family who had immigrated from Guatemala. And my mother um, would go and talk to uh, Mrs. Roca, and she would talk so loud to Mrs. Roca because Mrs. Roca um, spoke Spanish. And I guess my mother thought that by speaking louder, she would get through to Mrs. Roca in English. And it was very offensive. So we had to actually call out my mother and say, Moms, do not uh, speak loud to Mrs. Roca. She can understand you at a normal tone. You also want to look and communicate with the person first. So obviously, when we're working with people with ID, sometimes they have support staff or a paraprofessional uh, with them. It, it's not respectful to speak to the paraprofessional rather than the person. Um, that you're supposed to be talking to anyway. Um, they'll let you know if they need assistance, if that you need to share extra stuff with the person that's supporting them. Um, but it's very disrespectful to assume. Um, and that's the next point. I tell my kids and my staff never to assume. <laughs> um, assuming always gets you in, in the wrong, um, it, it causes a lot of problems, and especially in this area. You never assume that that person cannot do what you think they can do. When it comes to just communication tips with working with people with IDD, you know, sometimes you need to break down your sentences or your multi-step directions. Um, and this is probably with everyone. Um, I, I mentioned this in the workshop at convention that I have to do this with my husband. He has to do it with me. Um, you know, don't uh, share a three-direction um, statement to someone and expect them to understand all three points. I mean, our, all of our attention spans, honestly, are, are not that great. So instead of saying, hey, I need you to take them out of the dryer, I need you to put them on my bed, and then I need you to fold them and put them in the appropriate drawers, you need to say, hey, can you get, that, get those items out of the dryer? And then when you see that happen, hey, can you get, can you put it on the bed? 
or can you fold them and, and simplify it just a little bit? Sometimes individuals with IDD um, need some time to process the questions. I know I do sometimes. I, I you know, sometimes that's one of my biggest uh, challenges is speaking it and writing before I think about things. Because um, I really need to process what's being, what's being said or what's being asked. Um, and you do need to speak in a slow and safe pace, but not at a snail pace um, of disrespect. Um, some other communication tips, um, you know, don't, some people with intellectual and developmental disabilities do not understand sarcasm or expressions. Um, an example of this is, um, you know, the South has a lot of expressions. <laughs> and so I'll catch myself driving my son around and, and saying some expression that is, that is uh, fit to be tied, right? We fit to be tied or we're fixing to, right? Um, you know, then I have to say, okay, that's an expression that means blank, blank, blank. Instead of assuming that they understand the expression or that they have heard it, um, you really want to be direct and literal because most intellectual and developmental disabilities um, understand communication directly and literally. They are direct and literal. Um, do not be offended if they are direct and literal in a response back to you. Um, they're just trying to answer your question or respond to you. Um, use plain language and always provide choices. If you're at an event and you're volunteering with someone with ID, um, you may want to say, hey, do you want the tablecloths on the table? Or would you rather um, put out the food? And that allows them to understand what's out there. Um, options are always favorable. And don't forget that you know, everybody has behaviors <laughs> that um, you know can come to light from the conversation. I know I do this a lot. I've told, I've been pointed out that I put my hair behind my ear a lot when I speak. Um, you know, I know my son fidgets. My son doesn't when he's listening to a conversation. He doesn't directly look you in the eye, and that's okay. He's still understanding the conversation. Some folks do things to um, cope with the situation. Maybe they're nervous or anxious to talk to you or that you're talking to them. Maybe they're fiddling with their fingers and that's okay. It's not that they're not understanding or that they're not um, listening. Um, they just need a way to cope. And if you think about that, we all do that, don't we? In, in certain situations, we have our coping mechanisms and um, you know we we do those and so it's, it's we need to understand that those are going on, especially with this community. This is one of my mantras. Um, many people perceive people with disabilities as the ones in need of service, um, but they are actually a key part of engagement across the country when it comes to civic engagement. They need to be a part of that service. If we're going to be a truly inclusive organization as civic ends, if your communities are going to be truly inclusive, then we're, we all play a part. Um, they are not just the beneficiaries of projects. Um, they need to be a part of the project and serving other beneficiaries. Sometimes they are um, the beneficiary, um, but you know it. It's really important to understand they can be included. Um, let's talk about why they are excluded. And some of these you'll probably nod to. You know, some people may not have experience working with people with ID. Let's be honest, and you know, I'm going to be honest through the, these slides. You know, sometimes it's, it's an awkward situation. You don't know how to act. You don't know how to respond, and that's okay. Um, you don't know how to work with people with ID. That is okay. You can ask questions that, sh that should not prevent you from doing so, from including people with ID in your volunteer experiences. Sometimes locations may not be accessible. That's a very 